What if you had a guide who could tell you how to bridge a gap between who you are today and who you're destined to be? What if each week you could hear a story of someone who has tried and succeeded, or perhaps tried and failed, but learned something in the process? Limitless Spirit is a weekly podcast where host Helen Todd interviews guests about topics and personal stories on defining life's purpose, pursuing personal growth, and developing a deeper faith in Christ. The average lifespan of what we call being in love is two years. We come down off the high. And this is when love becomes a choice. Now, you not only have, have come down off the high, you may, like in my marriage, you may have negative feelings toward them now. Things aren't working out. You've got conflicts. You're arguing with each other. I think it applies in all human relationships, especially in close relationships, whether it's family or friends or whatever. And this is where love becomes a real hard choice, loving them when you're not feeling love coming from them. Welcome to this episode of the Limitless Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Helen Todd. As followers of Christ, we have the amazing opportunity to share God's love with everyone around us, our family, friends, co-workers, people in our communities. And sometimes loving others is easy, but often, whether in a marriage, a friendship, or even with someone we disagree with, we must choose to love, even when it's hard. To talk about what it means to choose to love, my guest this week is Dr. Gary Chapman. Perhaps you've heard his name or read his best-selling book, The Five Love Languages. Um, So his most recent book is called Love is a Choice, and it shares stories of people who used these five love languages in action and how it transformed their relationships. So in our conversation, we talk about how the choice to love brings hope to our relationships, even when all seems hopeless. Good morning, Gary. It's so good to have you back on the Limitless Spirit podcast. We've had an interview uh, maybe a year or two ago, and now your new book came out, Love is a Choice, and I am so excited to talk to you about it. How are you doing today? I am doing great, and uh, yeah, I'm excited about this book. It's uh, really kind of fleshing out uh, the five love languages in real life stories that people, they wrote their own stories. I just collected them, (laughs) but it's a powerful message. And so I hope that our listeners are going to get encouraged to explore the possibility of the power of love. It's amazing. When your book, Five Languages of Love, first came out, it was absolutely revolutionary. And to this day, it's a bestseller book. And I think it's, I I consider it the relationship Bible, if you will, (laughs) that uh, every (laughs) couple, whether they're married or dating, will really benefit from reading. So I'm especially intrigued about this new book, which seems to be the practical application to the five languages of love. Would you say, you mentioned that you're using the stories of people um, in in your book. Uh, Are these the people who actually tried to implement five languages of love? I think some of them, it was yes. Some of them, it's simply they're telling me their story of loving they weren't really thinking about the love languages, but in each of these stories, I, I just indicate you know, where they were speaking different love languages. Whether they consciously knew the love language concept or not, uh, they were using it and uh, reaching out to others. Well, I will ask this uh, sort of devil's advocate question, if you don't mind, and I'm sure you have uh, been asked this question before. When you, and you know, for a Christian, it's not a novel idea that love is a choice. Uh, That sort of um, is, uh, the Bible is permeated with this idea. But um, when you say this in application to human relationship, especially to the romantic relationship, doesn't this idea of love being a choice take all the romance out of it? (laughs) Uh, I guess it could if you wanted it to, but to me... Uh, it adds romance to it if you're applying it in a romantic relationship because it addresses what almost everyone agrees is one of our deepest emotional needs, and that is the need to feel loved by the significant people in your life. And if you do feel loved by those people, 
way, and it goes both ways, you both feel loved, uh, life is beautiful because it's meeting one of those deep emotional needs that we have. Uh, and the in love experience, uh, it does begin with a feeling. I mean, you don't get up one morning and say, I think I will go fall in love with somebody. I choose to <laughs> fall in love with this someone. person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you meet someone, there's something about the way they look and the way they talk that just uh, gives you an emotional attraction to them. And every time you are together, it gets stronger and stronger. And, it, and literally, it becomes an emotional obsession. You get obsessed with each other emotionally. Uh, but, you know, uh, Ellen, what no one told me was that the average lifespan of what we call being in love is two years. We come down off the high. And this is when love becomes a choice, uh, because now you not only have, have come down off the high, you may, like in my marriage, you may have negative feelings toward them now, because you know things aren't working out. You've got conflicts. You're arguing with each other. And uh, consequently, not only do you lose those euphoric feelings, but now you've got negative feelings toward each other. And this is where love becomes a real hard choice, loving them when you're not feeling love coming from them. But that's precisely what God did for us. <laughs> he loved us, the Bible says, while we were still sinners and sent Christ to die for us. So we're following his example when we recognize that love is a choice. And, uh, and you know, it, it, it really starts with an attitude, which is a fixed way of thinking. And if we approach any relationship with the attitude, I want to enrich the life of this person, you know, whether they're a close friend or whether they're just someone we've recently met, I want to enrich the life of this person. That's the attitude of love. It's the opposite of selfishness. You know, selfishness, the attitude is, what can I get out of this? How is this going to benefit me? Love is the opposite. It's the attitude of how can I benefit other people? So when you choose uh, love, uh, yes, if you speak it in the right love language, it does ignite emotions in the in the other person uh, because there is an emotional aspect. But this kind of love, biblical love, doesn't start with an emotion. It starts with an attitude and then appropriate behavior. So that's why I think it's so important for us to understand this concept, and especially in a romantic relationship, because you know the typical thing is uh, if I lose those euphoric feelings and it goes over a period of time that I'm saying to, to, the, to the spouse, uh, you, you're not making me happy. You're not meeting my needs. You know, And that's where many people end bailing out of a marriage. When really, if they change their attitude, I'm going to love them no matter whether they're loving me or not. You're doing a powerful act of love toward them. It's, it's exactly like God's love toward us. You're very right. And I think the unhealthy love... Um, or obsessive love, you know, is when the person who is in love is finding a fix for them in this love, where this love meets something in them that they're missing, uh, and and the love becomes all about that. This is, you are my fix for this problem that I have. So, and this is the wrong attitude because this love is not directed at the object of love; it's directed on towards self and meeting your own needs. And that kind of love probably won't last and be even damaging to both to both parties. But I feel like what you're saying is very true also in other forms of love, like in parental love of parents towards children and cho children towards parents. This is more of a selfless kind of love, you know, especially parents towards children. Uh, it's obviously more directed from the parent towards the child, but even that love can be challenged, you know, by flaws in ourselves. Uh, I, our human flesh is not perfect, and therefore it affects the relationships. And uh, there are there are problems, you know, in relationships between children and parents. And that's where also love becomes a choice um, of loving your child uh, in spite, or loving your parent in spite of, you know, the problems in the relationships. So, I think it applies in all uh, human relationships especially in close relationships, whether it's family or friends or whatever. Uh, but even with, even with people that you're not, not well acquainted with, uh, we, we, we're here in the world, the biblical Christian is here in the world to love people. And, and what if every Christian in the country had an attitude of love? 
And, and for whomever we encountered, we're thinking in terms of how might I love that person? How might I enrich their lives? Uh, I think it would make a huge difference in the whole climate of our country. And so uh, that's why I think this whole topic is so, so important. But you're right about children. Uh, you know, I sometimes say to parents, by nature, we love our children. You know, we parents love children. But many times children don't feel love. And that's where the love language comes in. Because maybe they're expressing love in one way, but the child has another love language. I remember the 13-year-old who had run away from home, and he ended up in my office. And he said to me, my parents don't love me. They love my brother, but they don't love me. I knew his parents. I knew they loved him. The problem is they had never discovered his primary love language, and they weren't speaking. They were loving him. They were expressing some of the other languages. But he wasn't feeling love because he, she, they weren't expressing it in his love language. So it's extremely important for parents to understand the concept and apply it to children. Because the question is not, do you love your children? The question is, do, do they feel love? Are you meeting that emotional need for them? Before we dive into the practical application of the love languages, I feel like we should do a recap on the five, what are the five languages in case uh, some of our listeners have not read your book. Yeah, okay. One of them is words of affirmation. You look nice in that outfit. I really appreciate what you did. You know, one of the things I like about you is just looking for things that you can affirm them, whether it's a spouse or whether it's a child or whether it's a close friend. It's just using words. You know, there's a proverb. I think it's chapter 18 and verse 21 that says, life and death is in the power of the tongue. We can kill people by the way we talk to them. We use harsh, critical words we kill them and we kill a relationship or we can give them life by the way we speak. So affirming words is for some people, their primary love language. This is what really makes them feel love. And then there's acts of service, doing something for the other person that you know they would like for you to do. In a marriage, it can be washing dishes, vacuuming floors, cooking meals, you know, walking the dog, any of those kind of things. Uh, but it's doing something for them with children. We are forced to speak this language when they're born because they can't do anything for themselves. We do everything in those early months and years of a child's life. But then later, we're teaching them how to do things. And that's a greater act of service. You know, cooking a meal is an act of service for a child. But teaching a child how to cook a meal is a greater act of service because you're getting them ready for adulthood. So acts of service. And then uh, there's gifts. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love, the gift says, they were thinking about me. Look what they got for me. And it can, be as, it can be a flower picked out of the front yard that a husband brings in and says, honey, I saw this and I wanted you to have it. It can be simple things. It doesn't have to be expensive things. And then there's quality time. Giving the other person your undivided attention. Now, I don't mean for a married couple sitting on the couch watching television. Someone else has your attention. TV is off, computer is down, we're not answering our phone, we're having a conversation. We're sharing what's going on in our lives. We can be talking about things that happened today in our life and how we feel about those, or we can be talking about ideas that we have for the future, and talking about anything, but we're giving each other our undivided attention. And then number five is physical touch, affirming physical touches. In marriage, that's such things as holding hands and kissing and embracing the whole sexual part of marriage, arm around the shoulder, those kind of things. You know, again, we speak this to children when they're babies. We pick them up, we hold them, we cuddle them. Long before that baby understands the meaning of the word love, that baby feels love by physical touch. So those are the five languages. And the basic idea, as you know, is that each of us has a primary love language. One of these speaks more deeply to us emotionally than the other four. All of them are fine, but if we don't receive love in our primary language, we won't feel love, even though we're receiving it in some other language. And that was uh, so simple and yet so revolutionary when this book came out. But when we come to the practical application of this, you know, even if you know this in theory, we all have some kind of a baggage that we bring into the relationship and these barriers that prevent us. Uh, even if we know what to do, um, there are certain things that are just hard for us to do. And uh, one of these barriers could be some painful memories that, that 
pull us back from expressing love to a person. So how um, how can we overcome these barriers? Yeah, I think, as you say, all of us uh, are influenced by our history. I remember the husband who said to me, he said, we read your book, we took the quiz, and my wife's love language is, is words of affirmation. He said, Gary, I don't know how to do that. He said, I never received words like that. He said, I, I, all I ever heard growing up was that I was never going to amount to anything and that I was lazy. And he said, I don't know how to say positive words. I said, well, you are where you are. All of us are where we are. We can't change our history. I said, but you can learn to speak this language as an adult, even if you didn't receive it as a child. I said, for example, can you tell me three things that your wife does well? He said, well, she's a good cook, and she's a good school teacher, and she's a good mother. I said, okay. I wrote them down. And then I, I wrote two or three sentences out beside each one of them. For example, on the cooking, something like, honey, I haven't told you this, but I really appreciate the meals that you fix for us. You are a wonderful cook. And I wrote two or three sentences like that. I said, now go on this week, twice a day, get in a room by yourself. Stand in front of a mirror and say these out loud. Just read them so you hear yourself actually saying these things, okay? He came back the next week. I said, now, can you say them without looking at your notes? And he did. I said, and here's your assignment. Go home this week, and for the next three weeks, you pick one of these, and each week you give her one of these. Uh, just one a week, okay? So he came back, and I said, did you do it? He said, yeah. I said, how did she respond? He said, well, on the third third week, she said, what's going on with you? I've never heard you give me so many compliments. <laughs> and I said, what did you say? He said, I just said, honey, I'm just trying to learn how to let you know how much I love you. And she said, that is so sweet. <laughs> so, you know, yes, hard. It was hard for him. He had to concentrate on that. But the, the fact is, we can learn it. And we can learn to speak any of these languages, even if we didn't receive them. Uh, in, 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 our, in our childhood. So um, I, I was uh, looking at the uh, titles of the chapters in your book, and they're so enticing <laughs> and unusual. Can we <laughs> pick out a couple of stories just to uh, deconstruct them, if you will, and see how it works, this practical application of the love languages? Yeah, uh, I'll give you one of a retired lady she was, a, she was uh, worked in public library and she retired and she and her husband, you know, lived alone and they were enjoying retirement. And uh, one afternoon when she was outside working in her garden, a little girl, five years old, kind of came through the fence. Like it wasn't a fence, but she came through some bushes into her backyard and, and said, uh, will you play with me? And she said, well, no, I'm working right now. And she said, what's your name? And she, you know, they had a little conversation together. And, and she said, will you play with me? And so she said, what do you want to play? And she said, I want to play uh, making house or, how, you know, uh, how, how, how's it? So, so she took her gloves off and said, okay. And they went under the tree. And the little girl said, now, this is the kitchen. And this is the, the bedroom. And you know, she's all the room. And she said, I want you to be the, the child and me to be the mother. And <laughs> so they went through this little routine. And she thought, well, okay, now I've got to go back to work. You go home. And the next day, the little girl knocked on the back door. And, and she went to the door. And she said, what are you doing? She said, I'm cooking. She said, can I help you? And anyway, they went on through it. It turned out to be 21 years relationship with that young girl. All the way through school growing up. And all the while, and, you know, when she went to college, she'd come back and visit her. She said she was the daughter I never had. But what she did, she took an interruption, an interruption, and she made it an opportunity to express love to a little girl. And all of us have opportunities like that around us almost every day. We just don't see them sometimes. We see them as interruptions. We don't have time to do that. But when we take time, you know, it's amazing, the power of love. And so uh, there are stories like that in the book that don't have anything to do with marriage, but they have to do with just you loving people that, that you encounter in your life. Well, and this made me think, you know, it's it's um, probably not as hard um, to take time and invest into a cute little child that came your way. But uh, what about people who are way 
out of our comfort zone, people who have different religious or political views. I feel like this is such an important topic because uh, sometimes in the passion of defending our convictions, we really uh, forget to love people. And so um, how, how do five languages of love work in those types of situations? You know, I think, um, I think quality time, for example, can be very meaningful to people like that. Because if they have strong views and they and they like to you know give their views and they're always giving views trying to convince other people, rather than combating that, rather than coming back and tell them how they're wrong and all of this, if you listen to them, you know, and you give them your full attention, which is what quality time is, you're giving them full attention, and you're asking them things like, "How did you come? Uh, how did you come to that decision? Or what led you to 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 make that decision?" and you just keep asking questions and letting them talk, you're giving them quality time and quality time communicates to everybody, but for some people it really communicates. And so what happens is when you, when you, and you get through with the conversation, you say, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that. It's, it's good to find out and good to learn where you're coming from, and what's going on inside of you. They won't, they may not at that moment ask you for what your views are, but as you have another conversation, they're going to start asking you, what, what, now, what, what, what are your views? How, how do you see that? Well, how did you come to those views? You know, and then as Christians, we have a chance to tell them how we came to those views, you know. Uh, so I think sometimes we miss opportunities to love people because we don't agree with them. And, and, and so because we don't agree with them, we try to convince them that what they're thinking and feeling is wrong and ours is right. But we don't treat them as a human who has value and worth. And every person, I don't care what they believe about anything, they're made in God's image. And they're extremely important, important to God. And we are God's representatives. And when we take quality time with somebody that we disagree with and listen and try to just learn more about them and then ask about other things about their life, you know, uh, you have children, you have, you're married, you know, what, and just, just questions about Showing interest in them and giving them quality time uh, tends to open up them to eventually want to know, well, what about you? Who are you? You know, what, what is your life like? And now we're building a friendship with somebody we disagree with. And that's, that's the art that we've lost in our country because basically we just shoot each other. You know, we try to convince the other person they're wrong and we're right. And we're not building friendships. And uh, friendships lead to influence. If you come to respect me as a friend and see that I have genuine interest in you as a person, even though I disagree with your ideas, you know, then then we're going to influence. We're going to have a positive, uh, have a positive influence. So, yeah, it's a powerful thing. I agree with you. And, you know, it's not just the lost art. It's literally the violation of second most important commandment that God gave us, you know, after loving your God, loving your neighbor and your neighbor is anyone in your surroundings. It it could be a person who believes like you or person who believes completely opposite of you but we're we can't love god without loving people around us and so this just goes hand in hand uh, with our obedience to god but uh my next question is um what about the relationships that seem to be broken beyond repair? Um, you know, it could be a situation of adultery in marriage, or um, sometimes the relationship between children and parents become very damaged and broken, or even friendships. Um, is there hope for relationships like this? And can um, the idea of love being a choice somehow help restore these relationships. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm very empathetic with people who are in those kind of situations because I know it's difficult. It's not natural to love someone who's not loving you. But as Christians, we have outside help. You know, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 says the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So with the help of God, we can love people who aren't loving us. Uh, I, I, one of the stories in the book is about a lady who, before they got married, her husband was really humorous and she just loved him. They were in love and all of that. But she said, after we got married, he just started to change. And then he started drinking and he just got angry and said he became a monster. And she said, I, I just think, man, what's happened to this man? You know, 
And she said, some of our friends who knew about it told me, said, I don't see how you can stay married to him. And she said, I began to think, I don't think I can, you know? And so they had a real solid talk one day. And, uh, and so he said, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'll, I'll change. And, and he did begin to change. He stopped drinking, began to change, and life went kind of to normal for a while. Uh, but then he got, uh, he got uh, muscular, muscular dystrophy. And, and, he, and then he got depressed. And then he started drinking again. And then he got angry again. And he was just horrible to live with. But someone, this lady was not a Christian. Someone gave her a Bible and also invited her to a Bible study. And in that context, she came to know Christ. And so one day she was reading in Luke chapter 6, where Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you. And she thought, hmm, that's the strategy God wants me to take. This man is horrible to me, but I'm going to love my enemy and I'm going to find good things to do. So she started speaking words of affirmation and also acts of service to him. Because she knew earlier that's what she had done when they, when the things were going well, and it took a while, but before long he stopped drinking, and he came back to her with you know positive words and appreciation and that sort of thing. And they had many many wonderful years. Now the disease kept getting worse as time went on, but they had a great relationship now. And she said eventually, of course, he died from from his disease. She said, but, but we really won the war. <laughs> Even though death, he had death, we won the war before he died to having the kind of marriage that we wanted to have before we got married. So, uh, you know, sometimes people say to me, well, Dr. Chapman, I tried, I tried speaking my spouse's love language, but it didn't work. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, for three weeks, I spoke their love language. It didn't work. I said, you, you're telling me that you spoke their love language trying to get them to love you. Is that right? Well, yeah. I said, well, that's manipulation. That's not love. <laughs> You're trying to manipulate them. No, no, no. I said, three weeks. No. You take an attitude of love, and, and let's try it. Let's say six months. For the next six months, I'm going to speak their love language uh, on a regular basis and just see what happens. I've seen this happen over and over again. If the person will take the long road, I'm going to love them whether I'm receiving love or not. And before the six months is over, sometimes it's, three months and four months into it, the other person begins to warm up because they realize they don't deserve, they don't deserve love because they haven't been a good spouse to them. And so they're beginning to feel, you know, this is not, not fair. I mean, they're, they're giving, they're loving me in a way that's so meaningful to me and I'm, I'm treating them the way I do. And I've seen them melt and, and, and the marriage can be reborn. So I understand people who have no hope, you know, and I say to them, I can see how you lose hope. I mean, I, in the early days of my marriage, I had no hope for a while. So I can understand that. I said, so why don't you go on my hope? I've been working with people a long time. I have hope for you. If you'll go on my hope for a while and try some things you haven't been trying, then uh, let's just see what happens. And so now we can't make the person eventually love us. You know, listen, God loves everybody and their people are still spit in God's face, you know, and curse God. So uh, God doesn't make people love him. And we can't make people love us, but we can be God's representatives reaching out to love people, whether it's in the family or out of the family, even if they're if they're not loving us. Well, um, and the, the next question is sometimes relationships can't be saved and and people end up uh, being hurt and broken uh, from from that. So what what advice do you have for people who are healing from the relationship that couldn't be saved. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, I think if you handle it right before you get to that point, like if you take this challenge for six months to love them in their in their love language and there's still no change there, yes, there's certainly a place to say, I don't know how you feel about us, but I feel like I've given you everything I can to show you how much I love you. And apparently you don't really care about our marriage. I don't know if that's true. Maybe you can tell me if you do care at all about our marriage. Um, but uh, I want you to know that I love you. But I, I'm not going to, and particularly, I'm thinking right now in a situation where there's been some physical abuse, if that's there, to say, I love you too much to sit here and do nothing. Uh, so I'm going to move in with my mother. I'm not abandoning you. If you're willing to go for counseling and deal with the problem, you know, I'll certainly go with you. 
you know, if you want me to go with you. Uh, but I'm, I love you too much to do nothing. And therefore, this is what I'm going to do. So that kind of love that follows six months of really loving them, they walk away and think, wow, I'm about to lose something. Because they've had something for six months. They've had love that they didn't deserve for six months. And now they're about to lose it. Now they're motivated to think I'll go for counseling, you know. Whereas what happens most of the time, however, is we get so uh, perturbed over the other person's behavior toward us that we we just we've been so angry. We've we've spoken harshly to them over this time and, and you know, condemning them and, and expressing our anger toward them. And then we say, I'm out of here. And they say, good riddance. Good riddance. I'm tired of you anyway, you know. But if you've given them love, undeserved love for six months, and now you're talking about moving out, they're far more likely to reach out and get some help. So that would just be my approach to, to that. But if it's happened and they have moved out and, and you are separated, I think, listen, <clears throat> none of us are perfect. And, and God is willing to forgive us wherever we are. Uh, and I think we, we, we can't afford to hold anger and bitterness in our heart toward a spouse who has hurt us so deeply. We have to release them to God. Some people call that forgiveness. I don't call it forgiveness. Uh, in the Bible, forgiveness is always a response to, for, to a confession of wrong. When does God forgive us? When we confess our sins, God forgives us. He doesn't forgive everybody. He forgives people that are willing to confess their sins. So I say, and I, I'm not, I don't say forgive them. I say release them to God. Put them in God's hands. That's precisely what Jesus did. You know, Peter said about Jesus, when people railed against him, he didn't respond. He committed himself to the one who judges righteously. He committed the whole thing to his father. So he, that was an example for us. We turn them over to God and say, Lord, I did everything I could do. I don't know anything else I could do. So I'm going to turn them over to you. I'm going to release my anger and release my hurt to you. And I'm going to turn them over to you. Now help me to use my life, the rest of my life, in a positive way. And you move out with God's help to do that. And God, when you put them in God's hands, you're putting them in good hands. Because God loves them. But God also is judge. If they repent, God will forgive them. And then you can forgive them. But if they don't repent, they're going to face judgment from God. So you're putting them in good hands when you put them in the hands of God. And you are now not allowing those emotions of anger and hurt and all the bitterness and all of that to control your life for the next 10 years. No, no, no. God has a plan and purpose for you. And he wants you to, to, look, to be a lover and reach out and serve people in his name. So to me, that's, that's the way I would approach that. Thank you so much, Gary. I, I believe your book is a very practical guide uh, for people in any phase of the relationships, uh, whether it's uh, romantic relationships, marriage, uh, parents and children, or even friendships. And so um, we are definitely going to post the link to the book, um, perhaps on Amazon. Is there anything else, a website where you would like our listeners to visit? Yeah, they can always go to fivelovelanguages.com. It's the number five, fivelovelanguages.com. And they can see little blurbs on all of my books. And, and they can also take a quiz there on the five love languages, for example, if they've never taken that quiz. That'll help you determine what your love language is. And if you're married, it's your spouse to take it and you can determine each other's love language. It can be a new beginning or a lot, lot of help on that website. I think it's a fantastic idea for those couples who have not done this yet. Uh, thank you so much for this interview. Well, thank you, Helen. It was good to be with you. You keep up the good work of helping people. Just as God chose to love us, even though we were sinners, He offers us the strength, the patience, and the kindness to choose to love others. Even when it's hard, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us who gives us all that we need to make this choice and keep it. To learn more about the five love languages and learn what your love language is, you can find um, the website, Five Love Languages. In the show notes, there is a link. Um, and along with the link, uh, you can find a, car, a link to uh, purchase Gary's latest book, Love is a Choice. 
We are just three weeks away from the Greater Purpose Conference, and at the conference, we will focus on the subject of hope and what it means to be a hopeful Christian today. I hope you can join us March 29th, 30th, and 31st in Branson, Missouri. Just go to our website, rfwma.org, and learn more information, and you can register right there. And if your schedule does not allow you to travel, you can sign up for the digital conference and enjoy it on your own schedule. Again, the website is rfwma.org. Until next time, I'm Helen Todd. Limitless Spirit Podcast is produced by World Missions Alliance. We believe that changed lives change lives. If you want to see your life transformed by Christ's love, Or if you want to help those who are hurting and hopeless and discover your greater purpose in serving Christ through short-term missionary work, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how to get involved.